Hello everybody, Tom Ellsworth here and welcome to Case Studies with the BizDoc. This week, we're taking a look at Amazon because you asked for it. Many of you said, how about a case study on Amazon? And I looked at it and there's a lot of ways you could go into that, but I thought that the best one was just to take a look at the essence of retail. And the essence of retail for Amazon is dominance. So we're gonna take a look at how are they dominating? Why are they dominating? Dive in a little bit because there are some lessons for you and me even as we enter into the waters of the digital retail ocean and maybe do something, whether you're selling t-shirts or doing something more substantial. Today, Two core points. We're watching history in retail. We really are watching history. And we need to appreciate what's happening. Even if it kind of makes us a little worried about how big Amazon's getting, there is something to watch and understand and actually appreciate. Point number two, digital sales for anybody is a three front war. And it's not the army on the land and the navy in the sea and the air force in the air. It is search, selection, and delivery. And we're going to look at all three of those of how Amazon is using those and dominating actually in each of the three areas to create an overwhelming market presence. Well, we know Amazon's been on a tear. If you open up the Wall Street Journal or any casual magazine, you see that they're doing something else or another big number associated with them. Okay, let's dive in and go from the general to the specific. Today, Amazon's worth $385 billion. You know, Facebook is worth $370 billion. So you hear about social media and all the things that have happened, and you hear headlines about retailers having issues, but that ain't Amazon. They've actually grown to be bigger than Facebook in terms of their value on the stock market. If we take a look at the playing field of retail, I think it really helps us understand just how amazing this has been. So we take a look here in 2006, this little list of retailers here was worth $400 million. And there's people we remember like Sears, Pennies, Macy's, Best Buy, Target, and Walmart, pretty big. If you take Walmart off this list, everybody else is only worth 186. So with Walmart, $400 million without Walmart, 186. And that wasn't too long ago, it was just exactly 10 years ago. Um, now we go to 2016, Sears is worth almost nothing. And by the way, Black & Decker just bought Craftsman Tools. So when you think about Sears, you used to go there for Craftsman Tools. I did growing up, because it was a great tool at a great price. It was really sturdy stuff. You know, it wasn't some bargain basement bin you might find inside of a Lowe's or a Home Depot next to the front door. You went to Sears to get Craftsman Tools because they meant something. Well now, Craftsman Tools are now part of Black & Decker. And Sears is worth $1.1 billion. You know, barely alive. They probably have real estate that they own that's worth more than that. And you look what's happened to pennies. Nordstrom's down, Kohl's down, Macy's under half, Best Buy under half, Target and Walmart. They're the only two that are holding on. And Walmart's kind of flat. But if you t now this list is only worth $300 billion. And if you take Walmart out, this list is worth 86. However, what happened to Amazon that same point in time? They were worth $17 billion over here, selling books, doing things like that. Now they're worth $385 billion. You know, I haven't said it in a while, but there's only one word for that. Damn! You know, I think if you take a look in retail and you see where it's gone, you say to yourself, how did this happen? Well, it just didn't happen because we decided we were gonna buy online. It didn't happen because we wanted to buy a book there instead of going to Barnes & Noble or watching Crown Books and Walden Books and all those other places and Borders got out of business. It's more than just books. It's what they did with their bookstore engine and what they were learning about how you and me purchase. If we step back a minute, I've got some more charts today I wanna talk about. You know, Black Friday, used to be all about it. Remember Black Friday used to be all about, let's go shopping and there were sales at all these stores. Now Black Friday is, it's almost like pay-per-view wrestling. You get to tune in and watch which store in America had a riot because some low price toy and caused all these people to run in to get the one toy for two bucks. And there's a big mob scene or they're at Best Buy for the, remember the $5 DVD player or the, the $50 46 inch plasma display and all these people are in waiting by the doors it's, it's not Black Friday, it's kind of like WWE. Meanwhile, everybody's at home, sitting there on their phone and on their tablet and on their PC, buying from Amazon and getting it delivered. You know, so retail's dramatically changed. 
you take a look at search. It's where it starts when we want to buy something online because we know where in the mall to go. We drive over here to this side to Macy's or Dillard's or Sears. We know where all that is, but online it's all about search. That's where you start your product. Right here, I'm going to show you something really interesting. By the way, this is a 10-year chart. I'm about to show you a three-year chart. This chart here is the percentage, right, of our choice of where to start a search for something we buy online. In 2014, we chose a search engine 55% of the time to go search for something. 38% of the time, we went to Amazon.com and we searched right there in the bar once we got to the homepage of Amazon. Over three years, search engine has gone to 26%, meaning today, 100 people decide they're gonna go buy something online, only 26% of them go to the Google box or any other search engine box, and of course, Google's dominant, to start their search for a product. Find me this, find me that. Whereas Amazon, it's risen to 52%. So now, when people go to buy something online, 52% of them go to Amazon.com and search right there on Amazon. Only 26% go to the search engine. So not only does Amazon have a huge treasure of all of our purchase history, where it started with books and goes on to other things, now we know what we're searching for. Because most people, when you come there, you're either cookied or you logged in, so they know what you've been searching for, they know what you bought, and there's this huge, huge mountain of information. I saw an article, I think it was back in 2004, 2005, and they said that the largest Linux database in the world had been built at Amazon and it was purchase data. My friends, that was 2004, 2005. I mean, go look that up. Hold me honest, gang, because I'm pretty sure I'm right about that, that that was the largest Linux database. All this information of everything that's been purchased. Search is everything. Knowing what you want, when you want, how to put things next to you, absolutely tremendous. And now, we're starting there first. You think, that, you think it's bad? Let me get out of the way and show you one more thing. 18 to 29-year-old people, 62% go to the Amazon box, 21% go to search engines. 30 to 44, 56% go to Amazon box, 26%. You know, I may have a new word, and the word is OVA. You know, I happen to think that this war for online retail, when you're going to find something, is close to OVA. Because when you've got this much data and an amazing search engine, when you go take a look at Amazon, they had a project that was called A9, and A9 was only about building as much intelligence as they could on their servers about what you and I buy because they wanted to make us happy. If you ever read about Bezos, he's a, just a very focused, intense manager, but you'll also see he's got a heart, a big heart for the customer, and you'll see that in things he talks about. He just wants to make it easy and make you happy, and if it doesn't work for you, make it easy to return. He is all about you and I as consumers more than you might think. So now that you've got all this search, then you go to selection. Selection, most people don't know, Amazon's not operating as many of those warehouses as you think. Now they got a lot of warehouse space and they deliver from that, but they have all kinds of secondary warehouses where maybe I sell rare antique books in Atlanta, Georgia, and I've got a few thousand books in stock. I'm selling them on Amazon.com. You just don't know it's me until you go to checkout and say, oh, this will be shipped by a non-Amazon retailer. And guess what? The boxes they give me, the invoices, when it arrives to you, it'll say Amazon. So you had an Amazon experience even though my little antique bookstore in Atlanta you know, was the one that got you what you wanted. So the selection with all of those stores that are locked in is huge. You know, they don't talk a lot about certain metrics at Amazon. They're really careful about that. But it wasn't too many years ago where they said they had over 1.4 million secondary stores connected in to the Amazon environment. Wow, if you can't find a needle in the haystack when you've got all that Amazon warehouse space and then 1.4 million stores in America, then you're just, you're just not paying attention. And you're searching for something that doesn't exist because it's all there. And it's truly, I, I think, a marvel when you go to find something that you dearly want and you can just find it there. You know, now we get to delivery. And delivery is, is this something I think has been spectacular and also a little bit funny. Now I'm gonna tell you a story. 
This is a battery for my laptop. This happens to be a new battery because my regular battery went dead and was only holding a charge for about 10 minutes. This battery arrived at my house on a Sunday afternoon in 22 minutes. Because when I went to check out, the Amazon thing says, did you know you have same day delivery of this particular product in Dallas? I was searching for something that was at a warehouse in Dallas on a Sunday. And in 22 minutes, this car drives up front. It's, it was someone who looked like a Lyft driver. It was an unmarked car. And they came up to my door and they had a little box, a little Amazon brown box, and this was in it. And I couldn't believe it. It, it. it was almost less time than it would have taken me to get this at Best Buy if I went to Best Buy and they happened to have it in stock. I was absolutely blown away. But you know what? They're all about delivery and their focus on delivery is not to be trifled with. A couple weeks ago, there was actually a funny news story, and it showed that there's actually a patent where there, in the patent shed designs of these airborne blimps that were holding inventory of certain things, like lightweight clothing and stuff like that. Do you know whose patent application that was, that drawing? Amazon's. So everybody was like, are you kidding me? They're preparing a fleet of blimps to carry kind of lightweight stuff that they could just have delivered to you with like a little drone comes up to the blimp and grabs it and comes down. Well, who knows if they are or not, but Lord knows, man, they invest in technology and they invest deep. One of the things that I was most impressed by that is it's not enough just to have some maybe a Lyft driver, whoever that was, deliver to me on a Sunday. It's not enough to have Amazon Prime so dialed in that you can get like one day or two day delivery. It's not enough for that. They're actually even thinking about airborne warehouses and little drones that would be delivering it to you. That just shows you that, that today is not enough for Amazon. They wanna do ever more and bring it to you. You know, I think when you take a look at those three that we talked about, search, selection, and delivery, I think search and delivery where we've had this innovation that's been tremendous because Amazon didn't make that battery. You know, Sanyo made that battery apparently. And so they're not about making the product, but they're about helping me find it and getting it to me at the best price, as fast as possible, as easy as possible. And that is the whole, that is the whole Amazon story. You know, within this $385 million valuation is a lot of Amazon cloud servers and a lot of Amazon IT. But you know where that came from? They built tools for themselves and then said, why don't I have this tool work for you? The same way they built the world's most incredible retail store, and they said to a million or a million and a half, whatever the number is today, of small people like my you know, fictitious example of an antique bookstore in Atlanta that uses Amazon to show the world all those wonderful books they can get their hands on. And when you put those three together, you get an industry powerhouse. And that's, that's really the story. The story that blew me away was this change in valuation, the change in Black Friday, and how they've used search to put it all together. And the proof's in the pudding, because the last chart is right here. In 2006, all these retailers worth $400 million, $252 billion in sales. Big box retailers, big boxes like a Macy's or a Kohl's or a Penny's, you know, the big retailers that are the big anchors at the two ends of the mall that you go to, or the mall you used to go to, because apparently somebody's buying from Amazon. But there it was, and then in 2016, down to 156 billion. So $100 billion of sales in 10 years, no longer happening at Sears, at Penny's, at Nordstrom's, at Kohl's, at Macy's, at Best Buy and Target and Walmart. You know, with, I shouldn't say Walmart, because to be fair, they're the one that's managed to hold, hold level. And I bet if you looked at some of these numbers, you would find some figures that show that Walmart being grocery first, low cost products out of the urban areas and the suburban areas and rural areas, that's still where their play is. But when you go to Amazon, this is, I think, a beautiful case study in, I'm gonna show you what you want, you know, practically before you know you want it, because I'll know so much about you that I could say, oh, you want that book? Well, there's also this book too. You want those sneakers? Well, there's also these warm-ups. There's an infinite number of examples. And that's the Amazon case study for this week, just kind of looking at the raw, stark numbers to understand just how big and how bad Amazon got. So as we go back to our two points, man, we're watching history. 
Whether you like what's happening or not, you have to appreciate the fact that you're watching history and a seismic shift in retail in America. And the second thing, whether you're Amazon or it's you and me trying to do something, search, selection, and delivery. And if you can help people find it and you can get it to them fast, the quality's in the middle, you're gonna get loyalty. And in the case of Amazon, they use a lot of data. So don't give up your data. You know, whether you're selling t-shirts, wherever you're doing, don't give up your data. Keep what you got and try to sell them something else and make them double happy for working with you. That's it this week. That's the case study. And <clears throat> we need a pillow. Gosh. Oh, oh wait, 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 wait. Hang on, hang on. Uh, after a throw like that, Paul, we got to do this again. Are we, are we doing this again? Or are we still on tape? We're live. We're live. We're doing it? Okay, boom. All right. Thank you for watching. That's this week's case study. Please subscribe at Valuetainment, the best channel on the internet for entrepreneurial videos and things that will help you build a bigger business in the future. Until then, I'm Tom Ellsworth, and I hope I left you better than I found you.